So the latest line of bullshit from Sniffy Joe, always press people, is that he lowered the federal deficit and the assault weapons ban lowered gun crime. Well, let's get right down to figure fucking his illusions. In recent speeches, President Joe Biden is misleadingly taking credit for cutting federal deficits by historic amounts, though most of the reduction in deficits is the result of expiring emergency pandemic spending. Deficits fell between fiscal year 2020 and 2021, far less than initially projected, after Biden added to them with more emergencies, pandemic, and infrastructure spending. And the deficits under Biden and beyond are projected to remain historically high compared with pre-pandemic levels. In recent remarks, Biden took credit for cutting the deficit by $350 billion in fiscal year 2021 and claimed his proposed budget for fiscal year 2022 will cut the deficit by $1.3 trillion this year. That was in 2022. And I quote, without the ums and ahs, nor the lost look on my face. You know the budget I, I submitted? My first budget, it passed and became law. It cut the federal deficit by $350 billion, Biden said in his speech on April 19th. We cut the deficit by $350 billion. How many times does he have to repeat something uh, that we know is untrue? And the budget I propose this year if it comes to total fruition, it will cut the deficit by $1 trillion, $300 billion. So when my Republican friends start talking about big spenders and the reason why there's inflation, take a look, take a look. We've cut the deficit drastically. Last year, as I said, we cut the deficit by more than $350 billion. This year, we're on track for $1.3 trillion in cuts. And look, what would be the, that would be the largest debt reduction in American history. Don't listen to my Republican friends in Congress. Last year, my budget reduced the deficit by $350 billion, Biden said in a speech in Portland, Oregon on April 21st. You hear me? We didn't spend, we didn't increase the deficit a penny. We reduced it by $350 billion. In February 2021, shortly after Biden took office and before any of Biden's fiscal policies were enacted, the nonpartisan Congressional Budget Office, CBO, projected a federal budget deficit of about $2.3 trillion in 2021, $874 billion less than the shortfall recorded in 2020. It projected deficits to fall again in one, uh, to a $1.1 trillion deficit in fiscal year 2022, meaning another $1.2 trillion reduction in the deficit from 2021. Combined, the deficits in fiscal year 2021 in fiscal year 2022, we're expected to total $3.3 trillion. Those projections assumed no new changes in federal law. But on March 11, 2021, Biden signed the American Rescue Plan into law. The new uh, emergency pandemic relief law included, among other things, increased child care tax credits, extended unemployment payments, small business support, and $1,400 checks to qualifying Americans. The law cost an estimated $1.9 trillion dollars over 10 years. Fast forward to July, when the CBO was able to take into account the new spending approved by Biden, instead of an $874 billion drop in deficits between 2020 and 2021, the deficit was then projected to drop just $126 billion from $3.13 trillion to $3 trillion. Moreover, the combined deficits from 2021 and 2022 were projected to total nearly $4.2 trillion. $842 billion more than the February forecast. It's pretty silly, Mark Goldwein, Senior Vice President and Senior Policy Director at the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget, said of Biden's deficit-cutting claims. He didn't cut the deficit, he increased it. They're taking credit for the fact that deficits fell in 2021 and 2022, Goldwein said. If they had done nothing, deficits would have fallen by $1 trillion. They fell by much less than they were going to. We should also note that while Biden credited the budget I submitted last year for reducing deficits, the fiscal year 2022 budget Biden proposed in May 2021 didn't become law. As we've explained in the past, president's budgets are largely symbolic statements of priorities, not legislation on which Congress actually votes. Congress never did pass anything like Biden's budget. However, Gleckman, a senior fellow in the Urban Brookings Tax Policy Center, told us via email 
Congress did finally pass an omnibus appropriations bill halfway through the fiscal year, he said, but it funded most programs at prior year levels, plus a small bump, and included none of Biden's ambitious tax increases. Ultimately, CBO said fiscal year 2021 ended with a deficit of nearly $2.8 trillion, about $360 billion less than the deficit in 2020. That's similar to the $350 billion figure Biden uses. CBO noted that the deficit for 2021 ended up smaller than it had projected in July, mostly because income tax receipts were greater than CBO projected. CBO said greater than expected revenue growth in 2021 was due to strong growth in economic activity following the substantial disruption in 2020 caused by the pandemic. CBO credited, in part, legislation in that enacted in response to the pandemic. As a share of GDP, which is really the way to look at this, deficits would decline from 12.4% of GDP in 2021 to 5.8% this year to 4.5% next year, Blackman said. But most of that action is due to two factors, the booming economy that is likely to increase revenues substantially and a sharp decline in pandemic-related spending and tax cuts. I suppose Biden gets some credit for this since he and the Democrats in Congress designed the American Rescue Plan to include temporary spending, Gleckman said. But it is not as if this year's budget included major spending reductions. In fact, many of his proposals would increase spending. In fact, uh, uh, in a fact sheet on the president's proposed 2023 budget, the White House boasted about the president's strategy to grow the economy from the bottom up and the middle out and his effective management of the American Rescue Plan, a strategy that was built on smart, fiscally prudent investments that helped jumpstart our economy. However, an April 8th blog post titled, No President Biden Has Not Implemented Historic Deficit Reductions, CRFB wrote with his emphasis, that the main source of falling deficits is the expiration of most COVID relief, such as enhanced unemployment benefits and recovery rebates. The remaining decrease is largely a result of strong income growth and high inflation. CRFB also noted that even after this post-pandemic drop, deficits will remain historically high. The president's actions to date have not reduced deficits, but instead increased them. CRFB wrote, between the American Rescue Plan, the bipartisan infrastructure law, and various executive orders, we estimate at least $2.5 trillion has been added to deficits through 2031 over the president's term so far. John Huntley, senior economist at the Penn Wharton Budget Model, agreed that the deficit reduction is mostly due to expiring pandemic spending by the federal government. The decline in the deficit between fiscal years 2021 and 2022 was largely expected, Huntley told us via email. As the Committee for a Responsible Federal Budget notes, Deficits were forecast to decline by about $1.4 trillion from 2021 to 2022. The 2021 uh, Congressional Budget Office, CBO, long-term budget outlook highlights the reason for the decline. Under current law, a huge amount of mandatory spending was scheduled to expire in 2022. Therefore, the federal deficit was going to decline under current law. Congress would have needed to explicitly pass an extension of these mandatory spending programs to maintain 2021 levels of federal spending. There's no such extension, extension passed. Uh, suspending uh, spending declined in excess of a trillion dollars in fiscal year 2022. A Penn Wharton budget model analysis of Biden's proposed fiscal year 2023 federal budget, which includes more federal spending, but also new revenues such as higher taxes on high income earners, concluded that it would reduce government debt in the first decade relative to current law meaning the law without Biden's budget being enacted, according to a conventional static forecast. That's rel relatively in line with the White House projecting that its budget would cut deficits by more than $1 trillion over 10 years. In a dramatic analysis, which included economic feedback that takes into account a projected reduction in the workforce tied to the proposed child tax credits, DWBM projected a 2.1% increase in the federal debt over the next 10 years, relative to current law but a 1.7% reduction in government debt by 2050. So, with all that said, he's a lying sack of shit. Let's finger fuck Snippy Joe's next lie, that the assault weapons ban lowered gun crime. Not a single study says that. The federal government's own study concluded it's a ban on assault weapons didn't reduce gun violence. So basically, he's a lying sack of shit again. Shocker, huh? 
Other studies, including two published in 2020, reached similar conclusions. Do something. This is a response, and perhaps a natural one, to a human tragedy or crisis. We saw this response in the wake of 9-11. We saw it during the COVID-19 pandemic, and we're seeing it again following the mass shootings in California. That claimed the lives of innocent people. In this case, the something is gun control. In Canada, where no attack ever occurred, Prime Minister Justin Trudeau, communist, announced the introduction of legislation that would freeze handgun ownership across the country. What this means is that it will no longer be possible to buy, sell, transfer, or import handguns anywhere in Canada, Trudeau said in a press conference. In the United States, the rhetoric is uh, tended to be more heated, but also vague, though some specific proposals have emerged. Over the weekend, Vice President President uh, Kamala Harris called for an all-out ban of assault weapons. We all know what works on this. It includes, let's have an assault weapons ban, Harris told reporters in Buffalo after attending the funeral of a victim there. On Thursday, President Joe Biden, while speaking from the White House Cross Hall before a candlelit backdrop, called on Congress to pass new gun control legislation, including a ban on assault weapons. California already has one. How much more carnage are we willing to accept, Biden asked. Let's look at the history of the 1994 assault weapons ban. There are numerous problems with this proposal, starting with the sticky question of defining what an assault weapon is. Assault rifles, which by definition are capable of select fire, are already banned under the National Firearms Act of 1934. The vague phrase assault weapon is basically a redundancy. By definition, any weapon can be used to assault someone, and virtually useless. The term might be effective politically, but as the economist Thomas Sowell has pointed out, the guns politicians choose to define as assault weapons typically are no more dangerous than any others that are not specified. We know this because the U.S. had a ban on assault weapons as recently as 2004, something gun control supporters recently pointed out on Twitter. We had an assault weapons ban for 10 years, 1994 to 2004, said Dr. Joanne Freeman, a historian at Yale University. The world didn't end. People kept their other guns they bought new guns. It was hardly an attack on gun owners. Uh, that was on May 30th, 2022. The Public Safety and Recreational Firearms Use Protection Act of 1994 targeted firearms deemed useful in military and criminal applications, but unnecessary in shooting, sports, or self-defense. They keep forgetting that uh, tyrannical government part of the Second Amendment. Freeman is right that the ban lasted a decade before expiring on September 13, 2004. She's also right that the world didn't end, and Americans continued to use and purchase other types of firearms. What Freeman didn't bring up was the effectiveness, or lack thereof, of the government's federal assault, assault weapons ban. Nearly two decades ago, the Department of Justice funded a study to analyze this very topic, and it concluded that the assault weapon ban prohibition had mixed results. Reserve researchers noted there was a decline in crimes committed with firearms classified as assault weapons, but noted the decline in AW use was offset throughout at least the late 1990s by steady or rising use of other guns, namely handguns. In other words, there was a decline in crimes committed with firearms that were banned, but the drop was replaced by crimes committed with other types of firearms that were not banned. While gun violence overall fell in the U.S. during this period, just like many other countries around the world, the decline continued even after the federal assault weapons ban ended in 2004. Authors of the government-funded study plainly stated, we can't clearly credit the ban with any of the nation's recent drop in gun violence, and any future reduction in gun violence as a result of the ban was likely to be small at best, and perhaps too small for reliable measurement. One might contend that this is just one study. No study is in irrefutable. After all, even ones commissioned by the Justice Department, however, other studies since then have yielded similar conclusions. A RAND review of gun control studies, which was updated in 2020, concluded there is inconclusive evidence for the uh, effect of assault weapons bans on mass shootings. Research published in Criminology and Public Policy the same year, 2020, concluded that bans on assault weapons do not seem to be associated with the incidence of fatal mass shootings. President Biden has claimed the 1994 crime bill he helped pass brought down these mass killings, but fact checkers have contested these claims based on this evidence and much more. Now let's talk about the problem of the do something mentality. 
it's unlikely the White House has enough votes to pass a second ban on certain semi-automatic firearms. But it's far from impossible in an environment in which many Americans, even gun enthusiasts and Second Amendment supporters, are increasingly asking politicians to do something. Unfortunately, when people say do something, they tend to mean pass sweeping legislation that infringes on civil liberties of others. Such thinking spawned the super state that sprang forth in the war on terror following 9-11 attacks. It also produced government lockdowns during the pandemic, the worst and longest depression in American history, and a host of other disasters. If history has taught us anything, it's that the impulse to use collective force to do something in the wake of a tragedy or crisis has created far more problems than it has solved. The economic historian Robert Higgs has noted that the most sprawling encroachments of freedom in history spawned during crises and tragedies. They have given rise to tyrants from Lenin to Mao and beyond. Even when powers are relinquished by government, they are rarely relinquished completely, a phenomenon Higgs described as the ratchet effect. When crises occur, governments always certainly will gain new powers over economic and social affairs, wrote Higgs. For those who cherish individual liberty and a free society, the prospect is deeply disheartening. As we mourn the victims of gun violence, we do well to remember that one true moral purpose of government is to protect individual rights, and any attempt to deprive humans of these rights for a greater good is a pervasion of the law. Now, I came up with a way that might make people more comfortable giving up their assault weapons. The government sent representatives to every Native American reservation. They ask them to give up their guns. The government will protect them. If they trust the government enough, after their past interactions, perhaps we can too. Good luck, you idiots. <laughs>